Oh, all right. I'm having a great chat with uh, Los Angeles-based film and game composer Panka Kunala, and uh, we're going to be speaking about her orchestral CD recorded uh, in the Bridge Studio in Los Angeles, a wonderful uh, uh, recording studio in 2014, released in 2015 on the Velez Saraband label, uh, The Woman Astronaut. And as she says in her program notes, this is, and by the way, it's a metaphor for your own life that we're going to speak about. Uh, it's, if, you, uh, may, if I may quote you, it's called The Existential Journey of a Determined Woman from Childhood to Maturity and from Innocence to Wisdom. Wow. Uh, and, uh, uh, the the, the uh, recording is, is, a, is a, uh, just absolutely stunning. It has also it's, it's several tracks. We're going to talk about it. But it, it's, about, it's about this uh, story that you feel very strongly about also about women period. Women in, in, in the uh, uh, space world. You mentioned that, uh, that uh, women were at that point, I think 2013, you mentioned that there were something like uh, 59 women by 2013 that had uh, flown in space, roughly 11 percent of all astronauts. Um, and as you say, and as we know, but it's getting better, I think, um, there's a, it's an even smaller percentage of women composers. So I salute you and congratulate you, but I'd like to just start uh, with, uh, with, with kind of, let's start a little bit at the beginning, if you don't mind. I am looking at a woman who made a decision at some point, I don't know, when you were a kid or something, you're going to tell me about it, to really make a big life for herself. And tell me about Sofia, your training in Bulgaria, classical training. Tell me about that. And then when did you decide, you know what, I'm going to be, by the way, immigrants. You are an immigrant to the U.S. and we cannot be happier. How dare people say that immigrants are trouble. That's ridiculous. Um, but I want you to tell me about this existential journey of yours from Sofia, Bulgaria, to Hollywood, California. Oh, by way, by way of Duke University, let me just throw this in, where you were, were the first person at Duke University to earn a PhD in composition. Okay, it's your turn. I was born in Sofia, Bulgaria uh, in 1967. I was classically trained. My mother is a professor of music theory and my father is a chemist scientist. So I received a very solid Eastern European classical training in piano and music theory and I composed since childhood. And I composed for theaters, um, but also in 1990, uh, the Berlin Wall fell down. Actually, 1989, the Berlin Wall fell down, and I was exactly finishing college. I was 22, 23, and my parents told me, you know, this is going to be a time of huge chaos and political changes, and uh, mm -hmm. seek out an opportunity to study composition in America. The whole immigration thing was always on my mind since I was a teen. I intuitively felt that at one point in my life I will go to a greener pasture and uh, I studied English, prepared myself, so I left Bulgaria in 1990 on a full scholarship, full fellowship to Duke University. Um, I had an exceptionally supportive mentor, the composer Stephen Jaffe, who is one of the most um, well-known American classical orchestral composers. So he was able to persuade the Department of Music and the entire Duke University to establish a doctoral degree because at the time Duke had uh, and, uh, it became the, fact of the first doctoral um, composition student, graduate student at Duke, and that enabled me to do my immigration. I did my immigration as an alien of um, extraordinary abilities back in 97. So basically that meant I could really follow my dream without any consideration for, you know, a job. So my dream was to become a film composer because all my life I loved film and I loved theater and storytelling. And at this point in my life, I identify as a storytelling composer. So um, I just came to Los Angeles in 1999. I was 32, just only knowing one person, uh, the very well uh, respected composer Patrick Williams, who recently passed away. He is an Emmy winning composer, Oscar nominated winner, of many Grammys a wonderful mentor, and I'm came through Duke. So with one connection and practically no money and a big dream, I came to Hollywood, and of course I had to support myself, so, but let's talk about how that, that's the next chapter. So the first chapter of my life is growing up in Bulgaria, classically trained, um, storyteller. Uh, there's this big culture of storytelling in my country, and I always 
film and theater, and um, that was my back end. So it was actually, in the end, a natural fit in many ways, the storytelling, and also your interest in fantasy and sci-fi and, and yeah. good stuff like that. Uh, Very natural, yes. So, and, and, and uh, you know, you, we've, we've talked about the, really the, 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 the serious uh, message that you are delivering with this uh, CD about women, about achievement. It was, important, it was important for me to shed light on a fact because this is a fact that uh, more women, like 11% of all women astronauts, you know, these are people who have flown in space. And astronauts is, I know it's a political profession, it's a modern profession, but it's like also the humanity's ultimate dream to be an astronaut. And if you look at um, film women film composers who compose for feature films, studio films, or women who compose, who get commissions for uh, by classical orchestras, is 1%. Even in the classical world, it's like 1.25, something very small, a very small percentage. Um, and the financial, the, the statistics are not very good, and then we have to wonder why, but the important question for me was just to basically raise this, you know, to shed light on this fact. So I thought to myself, I'm going to title, and it's just really interesting, you mentioned Mel Schwartz, my dear friend whom I respect. It was on the day of her celebration, her being celebrated by the ASMAC, the, um, um, the, the American um, Arrangers and Composers Society, she was being featured, and just in, in the morning before, before that celebration of her, I kind of thought to myself, I'm just about to go in here and then talk, and I always knew that uh, women are, there are more, there are less women composers than astronauts, but let me actually check the statistics. So I checked the statistics, I spent the whole morning researching it, and I, I found out, and I just thought to myself, that's it, that's the title of my next album, The Woman Astronaut. And so it happened like that, just, um, and it was the day I, celebrated as a composer and arranger. We're having a little break up now and again, but I think we're okay. Well, you des you describe the CD, The Woman Astronaut, as a three-act opera. I love that. Tell us. Actually, you know, I loved the programmatic music of 19th century, you know, all the symphonic poems. So actually, I think about it more as a symphonic poem for 21st century, because it does continue that storytelling tradition of, uh, you know, what Richard Strauss was doing, or... Mm -hmm or any composers who wrote in that genre of symphonic poem, or even Berlioz's symphonic fantastique, it's the same idea of instrumental music without vo vocals, telling a story and being very descriptive and very emotional and evoking very specific emotions. So I think of it more as a symphonic poem. Excellent. In three sections, maybe? Let me just do the three sections. Origins, yeah. Flight School, Space. And these three sections coincide with the three uh, phases of life that I've experienced up to date. You know, my childhood, being a young adult, now kind of going through school, starting my career in Hollywood as a young adult, and being a mature individual, mature composer, which is the third phase, maturity. And by the way, I, I'm not sure whether is, this is your quote or someone else's that I uh, read on the program, but it's, but let's do another another wonderful Close quote. Close to, yeah. At birth, Please life. repeat. And yeah. at birth, life spreads before us with a thousand doors, but the gates don't stay open forever. Well, this is this is from uh, Yom Kippur. This is from the Meiwa, the closing of the gates. Uh, my husband took me uh, to Yom Kippur service, and, and I actually quoted this text. From ah, okay. Let me just finish it. Uh, you know, the, the doors don't stay open forever. They close behind us year after year. I found that or just the, the, the quote itself such powerful imagery. One has to, uh, you have to... Uh, you have to enter, you know, have to take advantage of every door that's open while you can. They close soon enough behind you. And once again, uh, you know, you're a living example of this instruction, if I may say so. Uh, the, the, the door of self determination as a composer. How's that? Making your mind up and going for it. I don't know how, I don't know, understand how people like yourself have such incredible discipline because that, of course, is what it takes. Tell me about it. Is it from your family? Is it from whatever? Your genes? What is it? Um, when you're given talent, be that a musical talent or a mathematical talent, it feels like responsibility. It feels like you're given a gift. 
and uh, you have to do the best you can with the gift you're given. So I've always felt that sense of responsibility for the musical talent, and I also, f at this point in my life, it feels like destiny to be a composer, to be on that path, but also many people have opened doors in my life, starting with my professor Stephen Jaffe, my other professor Scott Lindroth, who was the orchestral is composer and inspiration. Also in Hollywood, so many people trusted me after I proved myself and gave me opportunities. And in that sense, I feel a sense of responsibility to fulfill my musical talent to the best of my abilities. So I would say it comes from a place of responsibility. Mm, wonderful. And, and you know, you composed and produced the CD, but you had an impressive team of collaborators. I think I mentioned to you off camera as I was reading just the orchestras, the Hollywood Studio Orchestra of, of, of professional musicians. I'm, you know, I'm reading a hand. These are some of the best, not only just uh, film and uh, and studio musicians, but they play all over the greater Los Angeles area in all the major orchestras. Uh, <laughs> What's the magic? Who, how, how, how come you? How, how come you're friends with all these people? You must be pretty sweet. Well, I, I have um, orchestrated for many composers over many years, and uh, they had recording sessions in Los Angeles. So over the years, in the capacity of orchestrator and really helping other composers build their careers, I met all these musicians. So I'm I'm known in Hollywood as somebody who has helped other composers in the capacity of their arranger, orchestrator, session producer. Uh, and then become, you know, when when you help people achieve their dream, then there's this goodwill. You know, everybody yeah. wants to help yeah. you back because it's like I've given, and now it was time. And the same thing with the Kickstarter. I mean, I had a wonderful Kickstarter to finance the orchestral sessions and the mixing and the production of my CD. And many, many people came um, to support the album, and and uh, there was this wonderful buzz and momentum. And uh, I, my intuition told me that this will be the case because, again, I'm known as somebody who has trained assistants and, and given assistants jobs and uh, somebody who gives jobs. But um, people were incredibly kind in, in, recipro in reciprocating at the session and uh, we had a great session with the great musicians. Yeah. It was wonderful. Because it ain't cheap. No, at that level, not. at that level, it's not cheap at all. Uh, you know, to put put this uh, CD together. Give me, and, and by the way, your uh, your uh, conductor. Yeah. Uh, let me see if I can pronounce her name. Imer Imer Noon. Imer Noon. Uh, she conducted most everything, right? Or did you? I read somewhere. Yeah. Some, yeah. And, and also the. Uh, but uh, I think I've seen a video of her somewhere. Maybe it was put up on your Facebook site. But I'm a conductor by training and, and some some modest career in Seattle. And I, I I always admire and you can hear it in the album. Conductors who have their stuff together who have that leadership to keep everything going and of course with this level of musicians everybody colleagues uh, it, it's just incredible um, how about well we talked about the enormity of the of the whole thing and, and this collegiality between studio musicians and composers and, and uh, you know it's a, it's a it's a really small world in Hollywood believe it or not in the musical world in Hollywood, and people are all good, and they're all people that have, do the same thing you just did. Uh, uh, we talked earlier today. You know, they're they're wonderful musicians. They have busy, busy schedules. They're in the studio. They're playing for the, the Glendale Symphony, let's say, uh, and they're picking up their kids at school. They're raising a family. They're paying the bills. Uh, when did you get married, and to and to whom, and how come? <laughs> I got married late. I got married late in life. I was 37, and my husband. Uh, we've been married now for 15 years, which in Hollywood is like 500 years. <laughs> He's a music editor. His name is Daniel Schweiger. He's also known as somebody who supports composers and soundtracks very much in the capacity of uh, soundtrack reviewers mm -hmm. or um, publicist for composers. Um, so through him, also I've learned much um, in the way of soundtracks and films. And I'm grateful for that. And we have one daughter; she's 12 years old. And um, yeah, so it's. That's a handful. I, I wanted to have a family because um, I I just intuitively felt if I didn't have a family, I would have this. I don't know. I just intuitively felt like I, I love kids. I love my daughter. It's good to have a family. It's very hard to combine um, everything, to combine a career, especially a career like in Hollywood, especially being a composer. But I just manage my time. I have a lot of helpers. I always have assistants. I train them really well because they have to help me uh, to work on jobs at a very high level. So I'm very generous with my time training people who are part of my team. Um, I work on 
orchestration jobs yeah. still yeah. cherish these opportunities. We just had a number one movie in the box office, uh, The House with Clocks on Its Walls, wonderful. with a wonderful score by Nathan Barr. He's wonderful. He's my dear friend of 13 years now, and uh, he his musicality is so rich and so deep, and I just love working mm -hmm. with his musicality because it's inspiring. And um, so that career also is going on. I'm continuing to orchestrate for select very talented composers at the studio level. In the meantime, I compose for video games. I compose my own passion projects. I got really busy with virtual reality games and films, which is awesome. And um, I just run a tight ship in terms of time and scheduling and um, assigning people, helpers, you know, assistants, different tasks. Because obviously, in this career, one needs to have help. A lot That's of help. A that's what I was waiting to hear because uh, if I'm, you know, I'm a distant uh, voyeur of the life in, in Hollywood film composing, but in terms of orchestration alone, uh, you can be told to have a, a whole section rewritten by 6 a.m. the following morning. I mean, it's just uh, crazy. It is very time consuming work, sure, because the music is orchestra and the music has to be really carefully considered. Um, I work with MIDI files and audio files that have been approved, so I can't really change them much, but I still have to enhance the voice leading and uh, mm -hmm. uh, just rethink the MIDI file for the actual orchestra. I love it. It's really wonderful work. It gives me a chance to do something I adore, which is the orchestra, work with the orchestra. And um, it has been a career I'm grateful for. But these days I'm making more time also to be a composer of my own projects. I don't and, yeah. Well, by the way, you just you just uh, led me right into. I just wanted to throw this out because we're going to get there t at the end of this interview because I, I want to ask you about the dream, uh, what the next dream is. But I just want to make sure everybody's clear. Winner of the Aaron Copeland Award, winner of the Sundance Composer Fellowship. Grand Prix at the Tokyo Young Composers Competition and, and a, a zillion other uh, things and that's even before Hollywood you know uh, that was when you're you're a, a so-called classical composer and then all the scoring you've done for for so many major major films so uh, it's just a, has been a glorious uh, career that you have constructed by yourself with your own incredible energy clearly and and, and brilliant mind Thank you. Thank you. I, I that was the dream. I, I wanted to collaborate with people. I wanted to work um, in uh, in Hollywood. I wanted to be a storyteller, to be part of storytelling, which filmmaking and game making is. And um, I pursued my dream from a place of profound naivete and from a place of, I would say, oblivion towards the challenges. I really, I mean, of course, I, I mean, everybody says it's hard don't do it, but I was just really defiant and very oblivious of how challenging actually it is. It's a career of people opening doors, and the reason I consider myself successful is because a lot of people have opened doors for me and have given me opportunities for growth, um, and um, I would say it's also a career where you have to continuously grow your skills, diversify your skills, grow your talent. Um, you cannot sit on your laurels for a second because everything changes. It's a career where continuously things change musically, you know, musical tastes, the director's tastes and preferences. Um, one thing I always felt really passionate was collaborating. I really love, genuinely love working with people and working with other people's ideas and working with my own ideas. So, I, uh, let, me, let me jump in. I was going to ask you about that, but I, I can't help but point out that we are looking at the inspiration for the woman astronaut behind you, Ender's Game. I think you mentioned well, it. That yeah, yeah. yeah, I worked as an orchestrator on Ender's Game, uh, uh, composed by Steve Jablonski, who is my mentor and the one composer who gives me amazing jobs. We just worked this summer on uh, Skyscraper, the big blockbuster. So um, I'm very grateful to him. So Ender's Game, um, I orchestrated, I think it was 2014, and what I really enjoyed was the three-act structure, which is like the hero's journey, and in Ender's Game, it's exactly the same three-act structure. It's Ender's life as a child, then he goes to school, gets beat up and gets bullied, and people pick on him, and then at the end, he becomes a mature adult and uh, has to save the Earth from uh, alien invasion. <laughs> So I, I found the structure to be, and the woman astronaut borrowed 
that exact model. It's uh, it's the woman asking about this journey um, in her childhood, then young adult, you know, school and early years in Hollywood and maturity. And uh, maybe you noticed how the tone and the character of the music also changed because in youth, in, in childhood, you have that exuberance and many ideas and activity. Uh, and that's youth and, um, and then childhood. Then youth has more of a drive and perseverance and ambition. And, and that's the second, the tone of the second part. But then in the third part, there is darkness. There's dark, darkness and there's resignation. And there is also kind of a sense of destiny. And that's what, what happens when we all <laughs> mature. Right? <laughs> and I would describe uh, I'd describe your music as, and, and, and this is what just amazes me as a conductor, orchestration. Yeah. I, I can't do it. I don't. I have any interest. I don't have the patience to orchestrate anything. Ugh, must drive. It would drive me crazy. Uh, but but I, I I love the mastery. Your mastery of orchestration. The colors. The electronics. The subtle little things. By the way, I think the I, I love the opening and ending. If I'm not mistaken, of the CD. Kind of a haunted uh, Baltic tune or something from the Balkans. I mean, there's just like something about a shadow memory of your youth. I don't know, whatever that is. Am I closer or way off? No, you're close. Um, so the entire city was supposed to have an emotional arc, a very clear emotional arc from innocence and brightness to maturity and darkness. Uh, so the first track is all about exuberance and uh, energy and actually the, the all a child experiences when they first watch Earth or space or planets on TV because this was my memory uh, from fifth grade when I first watched um, the Bulgarian astronaut going to space for the first time, the first Bulgarian astronaut. Um, so I just remember that memory of like total exuberance. I was 12 years old. And uh, so that was the beginning of the journey. But then towards the end of the journey, I was very determined that the city will end with this gothic requiem, kind of big sci-fi, big gothic piece which was also inspired by another big work I worked on in the capacity of orchestrator. It was a Japanese game called Bloodborne. Uh, it was the featured game on PlayStation 4, and it came out in 2015. And uh, basically, it's a, it's a horror game, and the tone was very dark. So I kind of really got inspired by, by that tone of the game, and I was determined that the city would end. I mean, not because I'm a fatalist, I'm not, I'm a very optimistic person, but just as an artist, I wanted to create an arc, an emotional arc from light to darkness, from innocence to maturity and wisdom. And uh, that was my, I mean, I'm a very conceptual composer. I always kind of have these ideas first, before I compose any mm -hmm. note. It all, so it all begins with ideas, and these ideas were very well formed in my mind. Then, before I, no. then let me ask this mundane question. I love the way you write for percussion. Where <laughs> did that come from? I, it gets me up and up and pulsing and my heart throbbing and everything else. It's, it's so, so, uh, so magnificent. What, what I, is I owe, no, this is, I owe this to Steve Jablonski. Steve Jablonski is a modern composer. He, he, he but I never worked in Hans Zimmer's um, company. So um, the whole percussive drive and arrangement comes from my very close work with Steve Jablonski over 14 years now, because his arrangements of the percussion specifically are similar, and I learned from him. And also wonderful real-life sounds that, that are, are, are hiding in little nooks and crannies for your ears to discover. I just love that. How, how does, how do you, how do you imagine, how do you imagine these things? You just, you have to be very organized, I presume. Yes, yes, no, uh, again, I go from an idea and gestalt, kind of a big picture image, to detail, and, and, mm. and I'm very, uh, the, the creative process is not easy. I'm not a facile composer, I don't think, um, so I would say um, another big idea about this city was working with soloists because I felt the soloists will bring an amazing uh, personal perspective. So I worked with some of the most brilliant wow. soloists who are also my dear friends, the flutist Sarah Anden, two violinists, the Bulgarian virtuoso Katya Popov, and an amazing, amazing violinist Lily Haydn, Lily, uh, because she, I worked with her on the first track and on the Nautima track, because she has a very deep knowledge of Indian music and world mm, music. Interesting. She's kind of a pop musician. 
So it was important for me to kind of tap into her multicultural, especially her understanding of ethnic music, because that first track was mostly inspired uh, by that cadenza. The cadenza was inspired by my love and passion for chant and my love and passion for Eastern music, and more specifically, you know, Indian, Pakistani spiritual music. And you also uh, worked collaboratively with other composers. Now, how, how, how does that work? Do you do rock, paper, scissors to decide, okay. I'm going to do this part, I'm, you know, somebody, I mean, do you get into fights? What? No, 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 it's super, super organized. No, it's none of this. No, it's super, like, for instance, I worked with an amazing um, electronic composer. His name is Jeff Broadbent, because I wanted to have one piece that is a little bit more on the electronica side. That's the piece called Training. That's the piece that opens the second half because I wanted it to be gritty and masculine and powerful. And uh, and Jeff Broadbent programmed all the synths um, and pulsing synthesizers to give it that kind of modern edge. Um, so I just gave him very specific instructions. I gave him, you know, use these um, pulsing synthesizers or use this kind of percussion I didn't have in my library. So I was super specific um, in the kind of ideas I wanted him to embellish. I gave him the orchestral component and he embellished the electronic component. And the same way with my uh, longtime partner whom I adore, Christopher Lowell. He's wonderful. He's a very imaginative um, composer and arranger. So same thing. I just create the whole track, the orchestral rendition, the percussions, and then I say to him, you know, use, create like a sound design um, that embodies, um, you know, like a rocket being launched into space, or he, he, he embellished on the sound design and percussion, and um, uh, again, with no specific instructions exactly what to do, um, that I, he was gonna do it better than me, and I didn't have time, so I found out um, this kind of creative um, arrangement and uh, creating of new sounds to Christopher Lord and um, on one track, and to Jeff Broadband to it. And by the way, you've just exactly explained how it works. I was so curious. Uh, you invite other other composers to add uh, colors and yeah. atmospheres and so on on top of what you or within and, and about and around and under what you have yeah. Uh, created. Yeah. Um, and, and that's a process that I've experienced many times in Hollywood because we're in a highly collaborative environment. We work all the time with other people with their ideas. And one of the skills that's a prerequisite for success is to know when you have a limitation of something, uh, and that's a good mm -hmm. thing to know. And then you reach out to your friends, and that's why it's really important to build these large communities of friends, composers, arrangers, technical people. Because, uh, for instance, I'm not really I'm a classically trained composer, although I have facility with electronics. I don't know deeply, for instance, certain types of synthesizers, and but I have an idea what I want to achieve, and I then reach out to. Uh, Jeff or to Chris Lord and I say we'll use that very specific pulsing scent or use this kind of a other gesture from dubstep which I don't know how to do really uh, but I know the sound and they then they execute that particular sound to enhance my music and um, that's a very collab good collaboration I'm always generous in giving credit in acknowledging my collaborators but only in general is a very collaborative field and uh, we all depend on our collaborators and we all feed off of each other's ideas and um, it's really important to learn how to leverage my strengths, the strengths of my colleagues or collaborators or teammates, um, also in, in working with directors to understand their temperament, their taste, their expectations and this all takes collaborative skills. You know, you mentioned uh, earlier off, off camera uh, ab about this life in Hollywood. Uh, you know what I mean? Diplomacy, uh, it's as much diplomacy and psycho psychology and everything else. Yeah. I think you've, you've just described that. Uh, I, I just have to ask this one, then we're going to kind of get to the, uh, you know, you have uh, at least uh, broken down some of the glass ceiling barriers. You, Nan Schwartz, others, uh, and other women composers. I'm, I, I think I have about five or six I'm, that uh, have given their CDs to me to review. Uh, so it's changing. I'm happy. I was a conduct, a male conductor. I didn't think I was a sexist, but I was. I had trouble with women conductors for a long time until I slapped myself around a bit and realized I was an idiot. <laughs> I, uh, my philosophy of life has always been to try my best to learn new skills always and um, in, in terms of working with people it's a skill that really one learns over a lifetime. Um, of course I've made mistakes in my youth and uh, every time the lesson from the mistake was painful 
and I promise my heart to learn and move. But the thing is, I'm in a career where constant learning is a given. Constant learning, building new skills, learning new sample libraries, new techniques, learning new music, understanding how the tastes change all the time. You know, composers come in and out of Vogue, and uh, my job is to know the taste right now, and uh, also in, in, in the midst of all these trends and everything, I still have to find my unique voice, my authentic voice. Um, I have to always ask myself, why am I doing this? What is the story I want to tell? Why does it matter? Why is it important for me to stay true to my voice and to my story? So, um, speaking about women composers, just now, maybe just like this year or last year, we're seeing more visibility, more interest, more genuine desire to open doors, and um, that's a good thing. Um, one thing I have to mention, I create these albums of my uh, own ideas in order to get better jobs. Uh, so with the Woman Astronaut, I received a fantastic job. Uh, it was a starry moment in my life. I was the composer of a new attraction, new theme park. You can think of it in the exhibit at the Kennedy Space Center, and the exhibit is titled Heroes and Legends. Um, it's seen by a couple million people a year. That's how many people go to Kennedy Space Center. And uh, it's going to live on for decades. And that's an incredible honor uh, to be able to contribute as a composer. I remember seeing the pictures you sent, I think, of, yeah. uh, of, this, you know, of, of your being honored uh, at the Kennedy Space Center. Really something. Can I just jump in for a second? I want to ask, are there any are there any scores from your, any orchestral, so-called classical scores sitting in a cupboard somewhere, or do you have the idea that you're going to break out of this and write your first symphony? What? No, no, no. I, I wrote, um, I wrote a short, like, overture type pieces when I was a graduate student at Duke. I, I would say my talent as an orchestral composer really flourished in Hollywood. But right now, just a couple of uh, ensembles have asked me, have commissioned me to compose for the orchestra, and this is one path I'm pursuing because I'm just really interested to translate my um, orchestral chops I learned in Hollywood to a more classical um, classical setting. So I'm very passionate about, I've been passionate about orchestral music my whole life, but now I think it, time has come for me to pursue opportunities to compose for orchestras. So next year I'll have a premiere of a piece um, that I got, I got commissioned by Sofia Philharmonie, which is my mm -hmm. hometown to Bulgaria. So it's something I'm right now really interested and passionate about at the same time as I'm composing for games and virtual reality and TV pilots and film. But I feel, you know, I'm 51 now, so in a sense it's like I wish to return to my roots. That's a big part of the journey right now. I'm sort of returning to my orchestral classical roots. Um, I also root as a classical pianist. I, I was a pianist by training. So um, these are the kind of projects that interest me. Well, the moss, uh, I think the expression is something about the moss doesn't grow under your feet, that's for sure. And you've just described making a living. You got to make a living, you know, it ain't easy. So you're, you're here, there, and everywhere doing a little bit of everything. And now may, possibly, perhaps, there will be a little, uh, a little uh, free time, is that possible in your career, to uh, do some classical compositions, so-called. Every time I do my daughter and my husband, because she, he complains that I should spend more time, and she right now is 12, so she really uh, needs my presence yeah. in a kind of a big, important way. Um, I uh, am grateful for the fact that the Hollywood community appreciated my orchestral talent, and I received assignments as an orchestrator because this is how I paid the bills for many years before the bigger composing jobs started coming. Um, so um, making a living as an artist um, is not easy, and uh, one has to be very flexible, very focused, also just very driven, and uh, life has a way of distracting us from our path. Um, in a sense, the woman astronaut for me was that kind of a gesture of self-determination because I um, I had been, uh, you know, a parent for a number of years, and I kind of got very distracted with being a good parent and also building other careers, other composers in the past with their orchestrators. So, at one point, time came for me, and I felt this really powerful urge to return to my creativity, to return to my musical memories, and to write music that comes from a deep place of self-determination, and that—that that was the woman astronaut. 
boy, I think you just put that whole thing, your life and everything else in a, in a, a wonderful nutshell there. It's perfectly clear uh, that you are disciplined, uh, determined, uh, brilliant uh, composer and fabulous orchestrator, of course, because of your, your career. Uh, I think we better wind it down. We're about uh, t at twice where we were supposed to be in terms of minutes. Uh, I have just had a great uh, chat with Los Angeles-based film and game composer Peña Cunava. Panka Kuna. Let me start over. I had it right last time uh, with the, the wonderful composer Penka Kunava. And we've heard, heard this story of a, of a woman that we can call uh, the existential journey of a determined woman. Uh, and the CD that I'm going to I'm going to be uh, doing a review. I'm going to put up some this this video and other things at PerformingArtsReview.net so that everybody can go there and, and uh, have a good hard look at this wonderful composer, very busy woman, a uh, very um, very clear human being. How's that? Thank you. I, I thank you. You're very kind. I really appreciate the wonderful um, support. And it's a great honor to be speaking with you. Well, it's a it's a it's a great it's been a great pleasure of an of an interview, and uh, I'm looking forward to having people see this interview and uh, getting an ex having an experience with your music with this CD, the woman astronaut. Panka, thank you. Thank, thank you so much for giving me some of your time out of your crazy busy life. I appreciate it. Thank yes. you. I just wanted to say one thing off sure. camera. You know, oh, please. Let me let me stop. Let